so I plan to get a lot done uh, in, my, in my new job. Uh, but um, Richard Grusom is away today, and uh, he asked me whether I would uh, stand in uh, to introduce um, Stefan. Um, that's not for any obvious reason. Uh, there are better people on campus to do this. Um, but I was maybe the closest one or something, or the one that uh, was, uh, he knew was coming because I had suggested the, the invitation, and, uh, and I was really excited uh, that uh, Stephanie agreed to come. Um, there was a brown bag session a little bit earlier today uh, that, was, uh, that was just fabulous. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, and I'm going to say a few things about it. Before I do, I have uh, two, uh, two points of business. Uh, one is that, as always, there's a reception at the Center for 21st Century Studies after this, and we will shut this thing down in a timely fashion so people can go upstairs and have uh, and have some uh, some uh, wine, and I hope some water. Um, you know, there should be some. Um, and, uh, uh, so, so that will uh, be up there. And then uh, I also wanted to um, uh, alert you all to, uh, you all already know, but I'll do it anyway, for uh, anthropocene feminism. Um, because I'm just one. There's just one. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the conference next week uh, that begins on the, uh, the 10th, um, there's, a, there's a poster out front. Please have a look at this program. Um, uh, I, was, I was actually uh, amazed when I saw this program. It's really, really cool. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to say a couple of quick things uh, 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 by way of introduction. This is like the classic stuff, with, which is like who he is. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing insightful here, so don't get like don't get ahead of yourselves. Uh, so anyway, um, Stephen Helmreich is the uh, L. Excuse me, my 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 my, my reading. L. T. E. Morrison Professor of Anthropology uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After receiving his PhD from Stanford University in 1995, he affiliated in various capacities at Cornell, Rutgers, Stanford, New York University, and Pitzer College before moving to MIT as an assistant professor in 2003. Um, I, I, I just say that because of this, like this, this new, the, the, the trajectory of people, you know, they sort of, you know, going to all these places, um, and uh, and now uh, since 2011, he's been a full professor. <coughs> Uh, his research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the, uh, the Wetter Grand Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Institute for Advanced Studies at Durham University. Professor Helmreich is the author of the 1998 Silicon Second Nature, uh, Culturing Our Official Life in a Digital World, which was UC Press, which received the Diana Forsyth Book Prize from the American Anthropological Association, and the 2009 Alien Ocean, Anthropological Voyages in Microbial Seas, also UC Press, which received the Rachel Carson Book Prize, of the Society for uh, Social Studies of Science, the Senior Book Prize of the American Ethnological Society, and the Gregory Bateson Prize of the Society for Anthropology. <coughs> His articles have appeared everywhere uh, in Representations, Artificial Life, Critique of Anthropology, uh, Cultural Anthropology, Critical Inquiry, Social Research, Science and Culture, Science, Technology, and Human Values, Social Studies of Science, and elsewhere. Based on work in Monterey Bay, Hawaii, and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, Bermuda, um, and elsewhere around volcanoes, uh, his, uh, his alien ocean anthropological voyages uh, is a study of marine biologists, the microscopic world, the deep sea, and oceans outside of national sovereignty. His current work focuses on comparative anthropology of waves and wave phenomena. Finally, I want to alert you to a recent article uh, co-authored with anthropologist Heather Paxson, who's also in the house today, entitled The Perils and Promises of Microbial Abundance, Novel natures and model ecosystems from artisanal cheese to alien seas uh, in social studies of science. Um, you know, cheese and seas. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and if there was ever a, an essay which was destined for Wisconsin uh, and, and for UWM at this point, it may be that. Um, and I was, I was reading it, uh, I was skimming it really this afternoon, and um, um, and, and, she was, and you guys are talking about uh, this, uh, you know, the, the, the culturing of local um, uh, microbes to create cheeses. And there was one Schleier from from Earthschmear, Earthschmear, Earthschmear from, uh, from 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 southern Wisconsin. Um, and uh, I was I that was a fascinating read. So I encourage you all uh, to go in that direction if you want. Um, and um, and I've been thinking about. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that happened today at the, at the Brown Bag was just the number of everything it seemed that we were saying was watery. Um, and, and it's just amazing how this enters into your vocabulary very quickly. 
Um, but uh, for me, I feel a little bit between the devil and the deep blue sea doing this. Uh, so, uh, so I'm, I'm excited that you're here. And thank you very much and welcome on you. Thank you, Nigel, for that um, wonderful, introdu wonderful introduction. And thank you, Emily, for uh, I'll Thank you, everybody, for, for having me here in the 21st century. And uh, let's see. Yes, this, I'm going to share some, some relatively new work with you. This is work that I've been doing for about six months. So it's very much um, in its inaugural stages. So I welcome any um, interventions that you feel necessary as I go through this. And uh, just to bring you into the deep a little bit, I think I'm going to turn this off so that you can see the images a bit more crisply. Here goes. How many waves are there in the ocean? I was offered one answer in February of this year at the Sticky Rice Thai restaurant in Newcastle, Australia, where Melbourne-based Russian-born wave scientist Alexander Babinin ran me through an ink and paper calculation. Take the mean wavelength of the dominant sort of wind-forced wave in the sea, say 100 meters, multiply that by the width of the average crest, also about 100 meters, and get 10 to the fourth square meters, the area of the average wave. Now, divide the expanse of the world ocean, 10 to the 16th meters square, by that area and get 10 to the 12th, a trillion waves. There, within earshot of breakers at Newcastle's tourist beach, Babanin had given me a mathematical reckoning of what Leonardo da Vinci once called the numberless waves of the sea. Why would one want to tally the waves in the ocean? For scientists at the first international Australasian conference on wave science, where I met Babanin, such accounting may aid in apprehending global wave weather and projecting long-term wave climate. I'd come to the workshop to learn the particulars by listening in on 40 or so oceanographers, mathematicians, meteorologists, and physicists discuss discussing wave modeling and prediction. As I discovered in previous anthropological work among microbial oceanographers, which is detailed in this book, um, the global state of the sea might be illumined through measures of its smallest composing parts. At this conference, organized by New Zealanders and Australians, and playfully called the Kiwi Oz Waves Conference, or COS, uh, one of the first wave meetings I've attended as part of this project that I'm beginning about wave science across media, physical, biological, auditory, and more, I learned that many scientists were interpreting water waves, evanescent entities known through buoy and satellite measurements, as well as through mathematical and computational models. They were interpreting waves as signs indices of climate change and perhaps of humanly modulated climate futures. Let me back up. Do ocean waves to begin have a history? The question may sound odd. Surely waves are simple facts of nature, matters of the substance of the sea. As historian of oceanography Helen Roswodowski writes, quote, most glimpses out to sea reveal endless waves reaching to the horizon rather than any lasting evidence of human presence." Unquote. Waves may ha have diverse manifestations in marine and maritime lore, a variety of effects on political economic enterprise, and a range of meanings for surfers, artists, mathematicians. But as formal and material entities the standard view might go, there they are, more or less well captured, by the scientific apparatuses crafted to measure and model them, which these days are increasingly computational and internetworked. For some wave scientists, though, it is not only scientific modes of representing waves that are transmuting, but also the patterns and shapes of waves themselves. As storm tracks shift up and down Earth latitudes, hewing closer to the poles, as the global distribution of significant wave heights wobbles, and the claim is controversial, as rogue or freak waves grow in number. So in this talk, I report on debates among ocean wave scientists about whether Earth's wavescape might be transforming in synchrony with the political, economic, and social scene of the Anthropocene. That name, ecologist Eugene Stoimer and atmospheric chemist Paul Kreutzen proposed in 2000 to designate the contemporary geological epoch, dating to the Industrial Revolution, 
during which human activity began to have global effects, effects now layered into a geological record marked with evidence of coal extraction, atomic testing, ocean plastification, and accompanying species extinction. Whether and how waves might be comprehended as elements in this world, primarily in association with global warming, is very much in the making. For wave scientists, waves materialize as events, often populations of events that may be predicted and perhaps managed. Waves for these researchers, I argue, are texts, media that might be read for something of the planet's future. And I should note that I'm not going to speak here about tsunamis, which are of course hugely important in recent eco-political history. And I'm going to follow for now, and you can tell me whether this is an okay idea, uh, my wave scientist interlocutors who make a difference between wind waves which are predictable, connected to climate, and therefore to things anthropogenic, and tsunamis which are detectable but not predictable. And I'm happy to talk about that more uh, later on. Donna Haraway has suggested that the Anthropocene might better be named the Capitalocene, since so many recent geophysical transformations have followed from capital-intensive extraction of fossil fuels. She has also proposed, after the Capitalocene, right, capitalism, um, she has also proposed that the collateral mess, oceanic dead zones filled with mucilage communities, new populations of jellies and slimes, has muddied bright lines between evolutionary pasts and futures and that, stealing a page from horror fantasist H.P. Lovecraft, eco-theory might take as its mascot Cthulhu, the tentacled monster of the repressed, abject, but potent Earth. And you might be able to see Cthulhu rising from the deeps here in this wave that these surfers are hoping to catch, not knowing, of course, that they're going to be devoured by an eldritch creature from the beyond. Um, we could call this epic, uh, as Haraway suggests, the Cthulhu scene, a heterochronic time, this is an image taken from a talk in which Donna Haraway forwarded this idea at the beginning of last week in Canada. Um, we could call this epic the Cthulhu scene, a heterochronic time in which the boundary between the ancient and the contemporary is mucked up. The ocean, a database of the primeval and the possible, might summon another name too, from Proteus, god of the sea change, the Proteocene, which it turns out is a name that was, has been floated by geologists um, for earlier time periods, so the idea that we could be entering a version of something that's already happened is very much of that kind of heterochronic um, attitude that I think Haraway is trying to flag with the figure of the Cthulhu scene. Um, now, wave scientists, at least as far as I can tell, are not keen to fold science fictional and mythic figures into their work, but they do read their primary texts, namely waves, with a fantastical, many-eyed, many-armed figure looking over their shoulder. That is, the figure of the human. At risk at individual, community, regional, and global scales, and also at the same scales in short-sighted denial. Waves, for wave scientists, have an anthropology inside of them. That is, an account of humanity. So, drawing on wave conferences I attended in Australia and Canada, I wish to sketch this anthropology. I want also to compare wave science in northern and southern hemispheres, asking whether there might be for oceanography, as Jean and John Komaroff have suggested for social analysis, something like a theory from the south. If the Komaroffs contend that, that northern, which is to say European and American um, mostly, frames of social analysis, things like the economy, the nation, progress, uh, if those things misapprehend the motivating forces of the world today, which the Komarovs, being Africanists, see as unfolding in um, the South, and which, which they use um, their experience in Africa to kind of uh, underscore, I detect among some oceanographers a claim that thinking from southern oceans, with, to begin, their greater proportion of seawater and ice, might be necessary both to upend the northern hemispheric assumptions built into some wave models, as well as to account for processes like intensified ocean storms, massive coral and mangrove depletion, and sea ice breakup, southern sea processes with planetary effects. In the 2010s, waves are measured by satellites as well as buoys, created, owned, and operated by a collage of governments, companies, and other agencies. Um, this is a map from the U.S. National Data Buoy Center of um, buoys that are 
stewarded by the National Weather Service, although it includes buoys that are owned and operated by other nation states as well, um, with which there are kind of international agreements. Uh, this is the web page for the buoy closest to Milwaukee, which is on Lake Michigan. Um, here's a story about a 23-foot wave that was detected by a Lake Michigan buoy. I've also put a figure from the children's film Surf's Up here, um, Chicken Joe, who is um, a surfer in, in Sheboygan, just to kind of underscore that there's a, there's a vital surfing kind of culture <laughs> available um, right nearby. Um, <laughs> this is a buoy that's outfitted with a webcam off of coastal Maine, so you can sort of be the buoy and see the waves as they come um, in sort of not real time, but you know, something like it. And here's wave buoy data right off of Boston, as well as um, a read of that on an iPhone. So all this data right, that's being collected by buoys is, is, is sort of bouncing around to different places. The and the data buoys gather are telemetered to lots of places, including to computers that host models meant to predict surges, swells, and freaks. Models such as Wave Watch 3, operated by the US National Weather Service. There are other models too, created, owned, operated, or consulted by meteorological organizations, shipping companies, coastal infrastructure planners, fishers, boaters, surfers, what portrait of the world wavescape is conjured through this mosaic? How would one even start to answer this question? I started not in Australia, but in the Canadian Rockies at an October 2013 conference in Banff, Alberta, the 13th International Workshop on Wave Hindcasting and Forecasting. Hindcasting is going back to see whether your predictive models could have predicted what you know has already happened. Um, this uh, workshop traveled under the title Forecasting da Dangerous Sea States. There were some 80 participants, mostly from the US, Canada, France, Germany, the UK, Australia, and Japan, though also a handful from such places as Mexico and Malaysia. Oceanographers, mathematicians, oil industry people, government meteorologists, all met to consider how to model and manage hazardous wave activity, particularly the kind on the rise with climate change, including storm surges consequent upon hurricanes. The workshop the workshop began, the organizers observed, on the one-year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, which brought so much destruction to New York and New Jersey. I want to describe to you the Banff conversation, but for that, I first need to give you a little bit of history of wave science. How have waves in the sea come to be modeled in a systematic way for weather, ship design, and coastal management? The first oceanographic accounts of waves arrived from 19th century imperatives in Europe and the United States to know the sea as a site for the extension of land-based activities, shipping, colonial travel, warfare, and communication. This is a, an image of a beleaguered British ship that's trying to lay transatlantic cable in the middle 19th century. Um, and sort of having a, a sense of what, where the waves were became crucial for this sort of enterprise. Um, I can also make a brief advertisement here for a wonderful book that's coming out by um, someone called Nicole Staris Sielski called The Undersea Network, which is an ethnography of undersea cable um, production. And in this book, um, she does this wonderful field work trying to find where all of the cables come to ground and sort of map the histories of colonial enterprise that, that those kind of reveal. Um, but well before computers and networked buoy systems, even into the 20th century, wave information was often gathered in the midst of the sea itself, as in these photos from the 1940s of ocean scientist Willard Bascom measuring waves with a ruler. You can see it here. Um, Bascom wrote of one big wave, quote, while balancing under this incipient waterfall, I would estimate the height of the wave that was about to come crashing down, add one third to that to, to get the trough, trough depth, and then call the answer into a microphone and duck, unquote. World War II was a turning point here. Bascom is working here in the upper right-hand corner on a duck boat, the sort of amphibious military craft that landed Allied troops at Normandy on June 3rd, 1944, D-Day, and uh, for which many wave models were originally developed to facilitate the landing of troops in Normandy. Um, Walter Munch and colleagues at Scripps Oceanographic in San Diego worked from a combination of data gathered at local beaches, 
international wave reporting stations, and this was new, views from airplanes. This is actually um, now a declassified document indicating some of the research behind the landing at Normandy. You can sort of see, sort of trying to figure out what was going to happen. Um, right, and, but this was now supplemented also by these aerial views. Representations of waves from on high, positions of detachment, argues Tara Rogers, were in, the early, in early 19th century accounts often accompanied by rhetorics of using calculation to get um, a kind of flux under control. Often, Tara Rogers argues, a kind of feminized flux into order. And, um, in Tara Rogers' paper on histories of 19th century acoustics and wave science, she did these wonderful readings of Helmholtz through loose irrigori and fluid French feminisms to sort of talk about the ways that the spaces are uh, and the sciences are gendered. The objectifying God's eye view is part of the tale here, but the story is more multiple. Of course, Baskin's uh, masculinity was all about being in the wave, and that was sort of part of how his gender formation worked here. There's a lot of stories that um, one can sort of unspool about how the gender politics work in this period. After World War II, wave science continued as a large-scale institutional activity. Military research into wave action during the detonation of nuclear weapons in the South Pacific. Okay, maybe this is sort of an objectivist domination story. Um, generated waves that we could nominate as anthropocenic, human-generated shock waves, waves unlike everyday ocean waves that travel faster than their medium, water, can carry them. And such explosions also left an enduring signature in the chemistry of world seawater in enriched bomb carbon, um, which you can use to date how old water is in the ocean. Coastal infrastructures projects called for new developments in wave science, as did offshore oil drilling. That practice that sociologist Jackie Orr has described as the release of a viscous inhuman intelligence, an emissary perhaps of the Cthulhu scene. Wave science came into maturity with large-scale socio-political economic imperatives, and in the US, these were keyed to the projects of mass society, military, urban, suburban, and coastal. A key inflection point came in 1961 with the invention of the wave spectrum model. In this mathematical formalism, waves are known not as individuals, but as collections of superimposed waves, little and big, with different origins and histories. A wave might be made up of ener energy generated on some faraway shore by a hurricane a week ago, as well as by fresh energy from teeny windswept ripples. Waves are rendered as, not as wavy side views of undulating water, that, of the kind that you see here, uh, but rather as collisions of bell curves. Oceanographers come to speak of wave systems, and the wavy sea becomes statistical. And a, a side comment that I might make here, as waves become statistical, they begin to look a lot like their contemporaneous social world, uh, which, as Sarah Ego argues in The Averaged American, um, which is about things like Kinsey and so on, starts to apprehend itself as an aggregate of probabilistic phenomena. So both the social and the natural are being reformatted as statistical. It's not a coincidence that Elias Kinetti, in his 1960s Crowds and Power, makes the link go in the other direction. Quote, the sea is multiple, it moves, and it is dense and cohesive. Its multiplicity lies in its waves. The dense coherence of the waves is something which men in a crowd know well, unquote. And in other work, I'm tracking the figure of the wave in social theory. That's a whole other story, or maybe not. So here's how wave scientists explain waves now. The sun heats the earth. This is a little primer on waves. Um, the sun heats the earth, driving air pressure changes, and the chemical makeup of the atmosphere, is there lots of CO2, is there less, makes a difference here. And those air pressure changes in turn create wind, initiating waves, which are vehicles for the transfer of energy from air to sea. Enough persistent wind across an area of water, which is called a fetch of wind sea, uh, and that which will generate waves with a predictable range of heights. Out from under the influence of wind, waves are called swells, packets of energy that continue to travel and that move in groups or sets. Significant wave height, the average of the tallest one-third of the waves, is of keen interest to wave scientists, and wave spectra um, help, help them pick that out. Like many scientific objects, um, wave, objects like the species or like momentum, waves are abstractions, or I should say they're both empirical and conceptual. 
right? This is kind of an STS science studies point, right? Waves are both empirical and conceptual, which may be no surprise. Although such epistemic hybrids once made scientists nervous, even the founding figure Walter Munch about whom I just told you, he wrote, quote, inasmuch as these terms, fetches, finite durations are really great idealizations of the wind field over the sea, to try and write spectra for given fetches and finite durations is to endow these meteorological notions with more claim to reality than they deserve, unquote, right? So there's no such thing as fetch in the real world. That's just our tool. Although if you ask scientists now, they'll say, of course there's fetch. So that kind of abstraction has been concretized, right? So while waves have an evident materiality to them, they are also abstractions that take form depending on how oscillation is conceived, observed, and modeled. For real world ocean waves, that, um, that kind of capture depends on infrastructure, on networks of buoys, satellites, computer models. So I'll take you back to the Banff conference now. The workshop in Banff was inaugurated with a talk entitled, Are Wave Measurements Actually Ground Truth? So this is a, a picture of the PowerPoint. This is, that's a PowerPoint of a PowerPoint. This, a, this is one of the um, presentations that started off the uh, conference. Val Swale, manager of the climate data and analysis section, Environment Canada, in this talk, cataloged a dizzying inventory of buoys measuring waves in the world oceans. Looking at this zoo of brands and standards, Swale advised his audience with a good-humored world weariness, quote, you need to define what a wave is before you can measure it. Is your device measuring white caps, foam, green water, <laughs> blue water, unquote, and which direction are you measuring? Given that a typical buoy costs a weather agency or, or a shipping company around $60,000, it's worth some thought. One person joked that the directional wave rider, um, which is outfitted with an accelerometer, you can sort of see that at the bottom, um, to measure the changing speed of waves, doesn't always track which way is up. Quote, so that if you give it a lateral push, it might tell you that you've suddenly got a 30 meter wave, unquote. Swale's question, how to ground truth the ground truth about waves, was a lovely mixed metaphor, a phrasing that makes clear what practitioners are after, a point in the ocean that stays still. And these are representations of buoys. The one on the right is a, um, is a wave radar, which is used from oil platforms to detect wave heights. Um, and almost any of the kind of websites that you'll see, there's always kind of a very placid kind of ocean against which waves are supposed to be measured. Um, computer models of ocean wave dynamics assume a stationary sea, and a lot of work goes to, into factoring out the pitch and the yaw and the roll of buoys so that wave data can be delivered as um, oscillation against a kind of fixed baseline. As Paul Edwards argues in A Vast Machine, his history of climate modeling, quote, data are never an abstraction, never just out there. Data remain a human creation, and they are always material. Every interface between one data process and another, collecting, recording, transmitting, receiving, correcting, storing, has a cost in time, effort, and potential error, data friction, unquote. As media theorist Lisa Gittleman has it, raw data is an oxymoron. These are matters empirical and epistemic, as the next speaker made clear. Elisabetta Bittner Gregerson, working for Extreme Seas, a European university consortium dedicated to ship safety design, helping the shipping industry adapt to climate change is their motto, said that there are two kinds of uncertainty in wave measurements, um, aleatory or physical and epistemic. And the epistemic uncertainty with which she was concerned in this talk includes data uncertainty, statistical uncertainty, model uncertainty, and climatic uncertainty. Um, so waves flicker here between reality and representation. Waves, for these scientists, are mashups, amalgams of watery events, instrumented captures of those events, and mathematical portraits of those events, often described statistically rather than singularly. Obviously, you cannot simulate every wave in the ocean, one researcher advised me. If, as Alexander Babanin put it in Australia, quote, wind-generated waves are the most complicated objects in the universe, probably more complex than objects in astrophysics, unquote. They are also complex social objects, 
non-humans, at once viscous, undefined, defined, parameterized, approximated, computerized. Mathematical representations of waves in equations are concretized inside how buoys are built and in how models incorporate data. Waves are physical and cultural objects. Once waves as data are collected, transmitted from buoys, which have their own IP addresses these days, they can be fed into computer models, such as WaveWatch, um, which is a platform for forecasting futures and hindcasting pasts. Wave data can also be sometimes rematerialized in real and simulated water tanks, suggesting another way of considering waves as media, which is something that I've done elsewhere in dialogue with the fantastic work of Ava Hayward and Melody Jew, who have uh, both theorized water in aquaria and in art installations as a media technology. Back to the, um, the scientific story. Waves as data uh, don't just get piped easily into models like these. Um, buoys are political objects that are inside of jurisdictions. In the United States, waves have been officially considered part of the weather since 1973, when the UN ratified the Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, which tasked national meteorological rather than oceanic or oceanographic agencies with wave measurement. So if you want to get at a United States database about wave height history, you need to consult the National Weather Service, not the National Ocean Service. Um, so you consult the National Weather Service, unless, of course, there's a government shutdown, which there was right before Banff, which meant that US waves were closed for business. <laughs> um, in Australia, waves as data are curated by states rather than the federal government. One conferee told me it was a nightmare to get waves out of the European Union. Quote, Europe is the worst in that respect because they'll make some of the data available, but they'll keep the rest because they think it has some commercial value. And so, well, we're not going to give this away because we can sell this instead, unquote, to shipping companies, for example. Waves also have regulatory lives. One speaker reported that for the World Meteorological Association, quote, only wind sea and two swells are regulated in ship reports, unquote. And this is a, um, let's see. This is a map of waves off the coast of Japan. So on the left, there's wind, sea, and swell kind of indicated. And these are sort of what, what, the, what the agencies are legally responsible to, um, to report. So waves are phenomenological, technical, mathematical, political, legal objects. And sometimes they are carried into legal gray areas as when pirates pillage buoys for parts. Right? So there's also a story about places that are instrumented, but the instruments kind of go wandering. I, one, of, one person with whom I spoke said that they were trying to get data on a buoy and they realized that it was on a truck, that it was, not, that it was somewhere you know, not at all where it should be because it had been stolen. Um, computerized wave models go back to the 1960s. Built on millions of lines of Fortran code, such programs are similar to the general circulation models upon which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, depends. They run on fleets of supercomputers, which need huge amounts of air conditioning, contributing, wave scientists Riley emphasized to me, to the very carbon profile they are tasked with tracking. As computationally intensive as they are, wave models often sometimes demand more data po points than there are buoys. And when that is the case, models can conjure proxy data points, virtual buoys, created by interpolating between known data points. Such simulated ghost buoys can speed up prediction. One speaker explained how her team models storm surges. Quote, we've developed 1,500 possible simulated storms. When there's a storm coming, we look through our catalog of possible storms and we find a match or develop a stochastic statistical prediction, which we can do quickly since it only takes a second to run a scenario, unquote. Um, this contrasted with feeding real data in, which might take as much as 2,000 hours to process, which is too slow for prediction. Working with virtual waves makes some people uneasy. Two buoy developers I sat next to grumbled at the storm truck, quote, that's not data, that's made up, unquote. It's a question of situated knowledge. One presenter worried about ship design made it clear that he didn't care about waves as such only about whether his ships had hulls that would resonate dangerously with certain wavelengths, right? So it's about the ship rather than the water or the wave itself. The figure of humanity, individual, corporate, regional, global, saturates the science. That became visceral as news streamed into the conference of St. Jude, 
an extratropical cyclone that arrived in Europe on the 27th of October, killing 17 people. Just hours into the workshop, a presenter showed the day's headline from the mail, England was being lashed by 25-foot waves. Participants from the European Center for Medium-Range Weather Forecasts were gratified that their models seemed to be predicting the path, though they were upset about people heading out to the waves anyway. We can't save everyone, one participant exclaimed at a picture of a kite surfer, <coughs> but everybody moaned at the story of a 14-year-old swept out to sea. Talk of probability becomes talk of risk when human elements are introduced, one speaker remarked. Such attention to individual humans contrasted with talks about populations of coastal dwellers. Conversation turned to storm surges, what one speaker called, quote, the stupid big brothers of waves, unquote. It was here that differences between nation states differently positioned geopolitically in the so-called North and South emerged as a topic. UK scientist Matt Lewis spoke about the World Meteorological Organization's Coastal Inundation Forecasting Demonstration Project, aimed at improving forecasts for such places as Bangladesh, a low-lying country with a history of devastating storm surge surges that have killed hundreds of thousands of people. He commented that it is, quote, hard to get data into a model for such settings because they are data poor, unquote. That is not dotted with measurement instruments. More, surge models imported from elsewhere don't always work. The mangrove forests and dense coastal villages of Bangladesh are not written into off-the-shelf models. Facts on the ground vary, and they change. Open ocean and hemispheric dynamics don't stay still either. I found a dramatic global picture at a conference poster presentation entitled Impact of Climate Change on the Future Global Wind, Sea, and Swell Climates. Um, here's a close-up of one of the images from it. Lured in by, lust by lustrously colored maps of world seascapes, I found Portuguese oceanographer Alvaro Semedo explaining future wave climate. He had taken global data about significant wave heights from the present day, which was defined as from 1959 to 1990, and, and then assuming a steady increase of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is the IPCC's anthropogenic scenario, he had projected significant wave heights into the future from the years 2069 to 2100. His prognosis? Climate change will generate larger significant wave heights in the southern oceans, rendered here in red, just to kind of say emergency, I guess, um, which will correlate with more extreme weather, storms, droughts, and with an accelerated breaking up by wave action of Antarctic ice. An Australian wave scientist animatedly joining in, remarked that Homo sapiens sapiens were driving the planet to disaster. Heat waves in Australia, floods in South Asia, collapsing agricultural infrastructure in Africa, waves of climate refugees. It was impossible, he complained, to get politicians to think geophysically. Quote, politicians don't understand physics, and physics doesn't recognize politicians, unquote. Yes, another scientist chimed in, quote, that's the thing. Weather and waves don't recognize borders, unquote. Suddenly, I was in the Anthropocene, with humans the agents and destinations for thinking about global climate. With climate, as Dipesh Chakrabarti has remarked, a process at once natural and historical, what Ian Balcom, extending Chakrabarti's parsing of history into history one, enlightenment historicism, and history two, subaltern, post-colonial, sometimes supernatural accounts, has proposed might be called history three, kind of the collision of the natural and the historical. And I gather that recently that Balcom here called for a history of four degrees centigrade, keyed to the temperature rise projected for the next century, and maybe this is one visual aid for that kind of uh, project. Talking about things anthropocentric, or sorry, anthropocenic, that's a telling slip. <laughs> Talking about things anthropocenic with these scientists, with my being an anthropologist now an authorizing rather than a what are you doing here identity, saw me chatting with them about how North Atlantic hopes for wave energy might founder if wave heights decreased there in the Northern Hemisphere, how coastal infrastructures might drown, how shipping routes might go haywire. Soon we were all hopped up. I asked about a claim I heard about rogue waves, statistically unexpected waves, defined as twice the significant wave height of their local surrounds. Elisabetta Bittner Gregerson of Extreme Seas argued that bigger storms in the southern oceans might lead to an increase in rogue waves. My interlocutors were divided on that claim, though they all believed that such waves existed. 
Whereas once upon a time, rogue, sometimes known as freak waves, were considered mythical, conjured by credulous mariners, they are now accepted as real, though their rate of incidence is unknown. In 1995 came the first measured instance at a North Sea Norwegian gas pipeline monitoring platform, the Draupner. In a field that treats, you can see here's the, the Draupner wave. Um, in a field that in a field that treats waves as statistics, this one was given a name as an individual, the Draupner wave, though in the image on the right, it's actually being played by an 1829 Japanese woodblock, woodblock print that you may know of, Great Wave off Kanagawa. So they have a substitute wave there. What, ca what causes such waves? They may emerge from the superimposition of waves in crossing seas. Um, so when they're, as in this kind of, uh, photograph when there are wave trains that are kind of crossing each other perpendicularly. Um, they may also arise from wave current interactions in the Cape of, Cape of Good Hope off the coast of su Southern Africa is notorious here. They may emerge from, the res from resonance events in which one wave sucks energy from another, which is a process that uh, scientists often describe using the nonlinear Schrodinger equation from quantum mechanics. Bittner Gregerson made her position clear, quote, we can expect that in some ocean areas where the wind severity increases, we will get more crossing seas. We will see more rogue waves, unquote. Here, rogue waves become more than epistemologically novel. They become ontologically new, or maybe ontologically amplified. They appear, too, as characters in an Anthropocene drama, non-human actors created by global humanity's geophysical agency. Chakrabarty suggests that the Anthropocene doubles the figure of the human, placing embodied humans alongside the human, capital H, a scaled up actor with inhuman capacities, such as the initiation of global warming. Rogue waves then are specters, materializations of the inhuman human. They are not like those breaking waves that were, for early Christians, a sign of God's beneficence. St. Basil wrote that at the moment, St. Basil, a long time ago, back, back in the fourth century, um, St. Basil wrote that at the moment when the sea meets the land, quote, it withdraws out of respect, bowing its waves, as if to worship the Lord who has appointed its limits, unquote. That's a history two wave, kind of supernatural, right? Neither are, are such waves emissaries of an unrepentant uh, modernity as for Nietzsche in Will to Power, Quote, how greedily this wave approaches as if it were after something, how it crawls with terrifying haste into the inmost nooks of this labyrinthine cliff, but already another wave is approaching, still more greedily and savagely than the first, and its soul too seems to be full of secrets and the lust to dig up treasures, unquote. So the kind of demystifying uber wave, I guess. These waves are not either like the wave of Octavio Paz's 1949 short story, My Life with the Wave, a a wave that the protagonist of the story takes home, a tempestuous seductress that might be tamed and finally dissolved in a kind of mer-masculine heterosexual conquest. No, rogue waves are of our historical moment. Like the rogue states, of which their name must remind us, they are just large and unpredictable enough to disturb institutional business as usual. They are part of human worlds, never accessible outside human grids of meaning no matter what some new materialists might say. The possibility that they are emerging most strongly in the South gets me to my next episode. So I return in this final third of the paper to where I began at Kiwi Oz Waves, the first Australasian wave conference. I was drawn here in part by the words first and the word Australasian. Now, I certainly did not expect anything like a shot across the bow post-colonial subaltern studies takedown of northern hemispheric presumptions embedded in computational wave models, a call for wave modeling to be turned upside down like a counter ideological south up map. This is one of the first examples of such a map which was made by actually an Australian. Um, and anyway, Australia, that is to say Euro-Australia, is hardly a distinct science community especially at this workshop, since in spite of the conference name, no one, with the exception of one postdoctoral fellow from Iran, had any academic base in Asia. With scholars from France, Germany, and the UK, this was a cross-equatorial eddy from the north. Still, 
there was a keen sense that Southern Ocean dynamics were underrepresented in wave science. One popular European wave model had been found consistently to underestimate wave heights by 20% in the Southern Hemisphere. And just the other month, Nature Climate Change reported systematic misestimations of Southern Ocean sea surface temperatures popping up in most climate models, which may be assuming a too low cloud cover over Southern seas. Something I gathered might be a topic at another series of conferences on Southern Hemisphere oceanography. Um, which is its own discussion. What other elements make a difference in modeling waves in the Southern Hemisphere? One Australian meteorologist gave me a crash course, rattling off four major distinctions between Southern and Northern Hemispheres. First, there is more solar radiation hitting the sea in the South than the North. This part of the Earth is closer to the Sun most of the time. Second, there's a lot more ocean uninterrupted in the southern hemisphere, which means that the proportion of the ocean suffused by swells, waves which are no longer driven by wind, is much higher, so there's a different kind of energy on the loose. Third, there's less particulate plant and animal matter in the near sea atmosphere because there's less land. Fourth, there is a larger area of ice in the southern oceans. This man put it bluntly, quote, northern hemispheric assumptions are built right into the models including of waves. That makes them challenging to use in the Southern Hemisphere." Unquote. But Northern Hemispheric assumptions can be hard to tease out. Southern oceans are much less heavily instrumented with buoys and tide gauges than Northern ones. One Australian conferee recounted to me a visit he took to Miami. Quote, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and they tell you the wave front will come in at 4.30, it will come in at 4.30. If you're in Australia and they say it'll come in at 4.30, it will come in tomorrow. Unquote. There's a simple geopolitical reason. Among the larger coastal nations that might manage such systems, Indonesia, India, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, there's not been a highly state-funded capitalized maritime infrastructure. Even Australia has only 25 buoys around it. The United States, just for scale, has about 200, which is not a lot either, but it's more. Satellite data is something that people often use to substitute, um, and that can do a lot of other kinds of work. Jean and John Komaroff write of that zone known these days as the Global South, that its geographies have been treated in social theory as, quote, a place of parochial wisdom, of antiquarian traditions, of exotic ways and means, and above all, as unprocessed data, reservoirs of raw fact, unquote. Ones might say that in oceanography, the Southern Hemisphere has been similarly constructed, a zone of unprocessed data, though much of the data hasn't actually been gathered yet. What kind of data to collect about open ocean wave action, about the wave agitated breakup of Antarctic and ice, about storm surges in low-lying South Asian countries is also an ongoing question. Let me return to what happens in transposing models from one sea to another. Practitioners worry a good deal about this, about what they call regional tuning. But the boundaries between the fundamentals of a model and their tuning is not always clear. Sometimes tuning means incorporating regional measures. Sometimes it means tweaking algebraic parameters to yield the right values, what some people uncharitably call fudging. A few t talks featured exhaustive details on such tuning. At one point, nodding to a couple of scientists who told me that listening to such talks was for them, quote, like having a drill held to your head, unquote, I stepped out to visit the New Newcastle Art Museum, a block away, which turned out to have an exhibit of paintings and sculptures of waves. When I showed postcards of these works to one scientist, he'd been too busy to squeeze a museum into his day, he judged them as he would have judged a wave model hastily tuned. Quote, that painting is missing the whole water column. This is just the surface feature, unquote. He had unkind words for the sculpture. Quote, it looks like it's done by a child. Waves do not break like that, unquote. What was true of the art was also true of the science. Quote, when you represent what a wave is, you can only do it partially, unquote. Let me give an example of partiality and politics in tuning a model, an example not from south of the equator, though from a country south of dominant centers of wave modeling, Iran. An Iranian scientist relocated, relocated to Australia described the challenges of characterizing the wavescape in a part of the Gulf of Oman known as the Chabahar Zone. Iran wants to harness waves here for electricity, but needs to know more about their dynamics. One problem is gathering data. Unlike the Persian Gulf nearby, the Gulf of Oman has very poor buoy coverage. 
this scientist worked with data that he could get, plugging this into a model of wave action called SWAN, stimulating waves near shore. He didn't use the wave watch model that I mentioned, not only because it's somewhat better for the open ocean, but also because wave watch cannot be exported from the US to Iran, owing to trade embargoes, right? The wave watch is kind of stewarded by the National Weather Service, uh, which is part of the United States government. So this scientist needed a recipe for simulated wind and borrowed from a model made by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. It didn't work. What happened? Babanin uh, helped me figure this out. Quote, wave models traditionally are validated by means of observations, and that's always through some geographically linked observations. Satellites are global, but buoys are definitely regional. So if there's anything in your region and you tune your model to perform well in that region, then if you take it to another region where certain things are different, it can have biases, unquote. So in this Gulf of Oman case, average wind speeds from the North Sea to which the European model were tuned were substantially different from wind speeds in the Gulf. This was a natural scientific iteration of what Chakrabarty names as the logic of universal knowledge, which for the social sciences have often claimed, quote, first in Europe and then elsewhere, unquote, with Europe here not so much a full-blown ideological referent, but a set of teeny tiny technical details, so tiny not to seem political at all. The most striking Southern Hemisphere angle on wave science came in talks on Antarctica. An oceanographer with 30 years experience at the South Pole blended biography with climate history. Not only is there less ice in the Antarctic than when he started visiting, he lamented, its character has changed. Stronger storm waves have fractured pack ice, um, breaking it up into tiny ice flows of the kind that you see here. Um, and more than one speaker told harrowing stories of standing on these ice flows, attaching, attaching wave measuring accelerometers like this, um, when things get started to get a bit slippery and cracky. It was like the ice was breathing, one said. The ice was breaking up from waves under me, unquote. These scientists routed their sense of the global through bodied experience. One commented that fieldwork on the ice made global processes feel more, quote, real to him, more visceral, unquote. A few scientists used their bodies to mime wave action, reminding me of science studies scholars Natasha Myers' observation of molecular biologists who use gestural motion to get a feel for how proteins fold. The relay between inhuman and human sometimes travels through the sensory substance of the human body. Accelerating ice melt, the consensus had it, will affect everything from ocean circulation to coastal upwellings of nutrients from the deep. New modeling tools are called for. As one scientist put it to me, quote, if you take parameters from the northern ocean, they don't necessarily apply to the southern ocean. Who cares about the southern ocean except us? But people will start caring if it affects global climate, unquote. As the Komarov suggest, quote, it is the south that is often the first to feel the effects of world historical forces, Unquote. And so we could say about Antarctica, quote, the history of the present reveals itself more starkly at the poles, unquote. Funding for wave modeling in Antarctic settings is on the rise, and the scientists in Australia are well positioned. Jessica O'Reilly, in her forthcoming ethnography of Antarctic science, Technocratic Wilderness, observes that Antarctica has been reinvented many times as a site of extremes. It has been, long been a site of possible futures as well. Wave science follows this tradition. A wave theory from the South, the wave theory from the South that emerged at this conference was just one among many possible ones you could imagine. If you saw the New York Times last week, you could think of a wave theory from the South that what might focus on storm surges in countries open to Southern Hemisphere cyclones like Bangladesh or the Philippines. And I'm still on the lookout for those kinds of things in this project, which as I indicated, I'm just sort of beginning here. So, on my way back to Boston, uh, to where I live, I went through Sydney and at the, museum, at the city's maritime museum I saw an exhibit about northern aboriginal maps of sea country, bark paintings created in the 1990s as legal documents to shore up Yonglu claims to sea space, like this one which maps water and energy in country around the mouth of the Barataita River. Territories of different uh, aboriginal clan moieties are marked here with distinct designs. So, this, so the sort of territorial claims of different moieties are indicated either by these straight lines or by these more wavy lines. And these, these are actually legal documents for um, contesting uh, 
uh, incursions into that territory. Now, although one might be tempted to see in these lines something like waves, something else hit me. At the exhibit's entrance was a cultural warning for Aboriginal museum goers, cautioning that the names of deceased artists were recorded next to some paintings. Aboriginal prohibitions against naming the recently dead, the warning urged, might make the uh, exhibit uh, upsetting or offensive to some visitors. An anthropologist schooled in Aboriginal studies might ask how models of humanness as relational multi-species personhood are woven into watery representations such as this. As an anthropologist of science, this painting prompted me to consider how models of humanness were folded into the watery models I'd learned about in Newcastle. On beyond the fact that the WAVE conference had at its center Chakrabarty's doubled human, embodied human that's at risk, and capital H humanity to blame, the workshop was, like the bark painting exhibit, crowded with the names of the deceased. Laplace, Kelvin, Bernoulli, Euler, Fourier, those 19th and 18th and 19th century mathematicians whose names are commemorated and remembered in the equations of wave science. So what is a wave? I said before that waves are phenomenological instrument data model hybrids, but at least for waves described by equations and by named equations, a wave is also a trace of a social history, um, often of a biographical history. In this case, a trace perhaps of history one, enlightenment historicism, though also perhaps given the religious views of many European mathematicians, a history two as well. So Kelvin, for example, was an old earth creationist and a lot of his science was inflected by his very devout belief in his um, work in the Anglican Church. The waves of wave science have people and biographies inside of them. It is also true that these are not all hermetically sealed European stories. When it comes to knowledge about ocean waves, for example, we know that such figures as Captain Cook were in dialogue with navigators from other traditions. The Polynesian navigator Tupuaya, who traveled with Cook, is one example. As the Komarovs write, quote, modernity was, almost from the start, a north-south collaboration. Indeed, a world historical production, <coughs> albeit a sharply asymmetrical one. Whatever its philosophical conceits, however hard it may seek to purify itself, it has always been a composite of multiple signification, materializations, and temporalities, unquote. I asked at the outset of this paper if waves had a history, and I hope I've persuaded you that they also have something of an anthropology, that they are artifacts that materialize relations, properties, agencies, territories, which are age-old preoccupations of anthropology. I'll come to closing in Sydney with another wave, the last wave, a 1977 film by director Peter Weir about a white lawyer contracted to defend four Aboriginal men in Australian court. As he's drawn into the world of his clients, he is haunted by visions of, and perhaps even sees, it's not totally clear, it might be a visitation from the dream time, a tremendous wave coming to wipe out Australia. The wave symbolizes the power of nature to destroy human enterprise, but also the crashing disaster of colonial dispossession and the return to the colonial power of the repressed of a history two lurking inside history one. In The Fire Next Time, in 1963, James Baldwin reflected on the state of race politics in the United States, arguing that overcoming the staggering racism of his day would entail thoughtful persons, quote, I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious black, unquote, to, quote, like lovers insist on or create the consciousness of others to end the racial nightmare and change the history of the world, unquote. Without such change, Baldwin implied, destruction would follow, not as for Noah, by water, but rather, as an old Bible-inspired slave song had it, by fire. If the problem of the 20th century was, as W.E.B. Du Bois had it, the problem of the color line, then the problem of the 21st century, the problem woven into almost all the wave science I have seen so far, is the problem of the water line, a line wavering and rising. Thank you. So we have about um, you know, sort of 15, 20 minutes if people have any questions they want to ask. Okay, I can ask a few more questions.
So, um, one, I just want to tell me a little bit more about wave time passing, um, what that mm -hmm. is, and, and what I'm involved. Um, but then, I, I would also like to ask you about the wave that is empirical, which is the of abstraction. And specifically, uh, do the scientists that you're observing, you know, do, you, do in a way the abstractions become empirical? Do they become sort of you, you mentioned briefly that some type of wave or some abstraction that people just talk about or that they saw it with their own eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we should say more about how abstractions become sort of familiar and objects of experience for people who are very familiar with their statistical representation. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Well, I can start with I can start with the wave hind casting bit. So hind casting is a practice of trying to forecast what you already know has happened as a way of kind of trying to test your forecasting tools. So you take data that's already been collected and you kind of pretend you don't know about it and you go back to a previous state, a previously described state, and try to use your model on that previously described state to see if what you spool out then maps onto what, um, what actually happened. So that's what people mean by hind casting. Um, there's a whole bunch of really interesting um, sort of model techniques that kind of go into that. One thing that happens that's quite fascinating is, is another process which is called reanalysis, which is to go back to old data and try to get it into the format of current day data. Right? So this is, this is always a thing, this, this happens a lot in climate modeling, that there's data from the 1950s about X, Y, and Z kinds of processes that you might want to use to think about the present, but that data is on punch cards. <laughs> and the question of how you get it into your, um, you know, your legacy Fortran system from 1970 that you most recently updated into 2009 is a big question, right? And so there's a huge amount of work going into the kind of the, the care, what Michael Fortune has called the care of the data, right? How people care for the data. And reanalysis is this process of kind of going back to old data and trying to get it on register so that it looks like you know, what you could, what you could um, think about nowadays, right? And we were just, prior to this talk, at the, at, at the um, what was the name of the archive that we just went to? The AGSL, the American Geographic Society Library. Yes, and we saw some mid-19th century maps that uh, Matthew Fontaine married and made of wind tracks across the Atlantic Ocean. And you could imagine people nowadays saying, well, that's interesting. He's taken all this data from ship logs about where they traveled and what the wind reports are, can we use that as data for weather in 1858? And you can imagine people saying, well, some of it we want to throw out, some of it we want to keep. So hind casting and reanalysis sort of involves all of this crazy care of the data that has to happen. Um, is it the same as red prediction, or is there something different? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I don't know the answer to that. It might be. Um, and then the question of the empirical versus the abstract, that's, I mean, once one is schooled in a particular set of abstractions, it becomes a re they, they can become real things for us in the world, you know, for, and, and, and unevenly, right? So wave scientists will see particular phenomena in the world as a result of what they know that people who are not schooled in those um, techniques will Will not will not see, and then there is a question of is that a real thing or is it not a, is it not a real thing, um, which is a philosophical question perhaps. I mean, this happens in social theory too, right? And say, well, I see what's going on here. That's what Karl Marx called false consciousness, right? That person thinks that they're exercising their free will, but in fact, all of their leisure time is just you know circuiting them back into a cycle of consumption. You know that I see as the analyst with this abstraction, but that's the really that's the really real, right? And it's there's something kind of in common across natural theory, you know, social theory and natural theory, right? Or the category of the species in evolutionary biology. What is a species? Is that a real thing in the world, or is it not? For a lot of biologists, they're fine with thinking of it as a really really real thing, and other people are fine with thinking of it as an abstraction. Well, it works really well for this kind of. <coughs> anthropoid, but it just doesn't work for these frogs over here, right? Yeah. So, or I guess you can think about clouds, right? That there, there's different terms that people use to talk about clouds. There's the cumulus one, and, this, you know, the, and 
are those real things? Well, once you have the language to do it, things you get concretized and people start to use it, right? And I think of that as a very social and cultural and historical kind of question about sort of the layering of these things. This is kind of a, and then sometimes the abstractions start to start to break when they no longer work, right? When it, things don't get picked out. Yes. So that's actually, that's one of the wonderful things I thought about your paper is that so often our discussions of the ontic get read as questions of ontology or epistemology, and there's something about this topic that makes us look at waves thingness mm -hmm. in, a, in a certain way. But I, the, the story you started off telling, I thought it was going a certain way, and I wanted to ask why it didn't. But that is, I saw that you, you, you were talking about sort of a 19th century representation of waves as things. Right. And then in the 20th century, they, they started to complexify into something like vectors, where, where they have this ambivalent relation. Right. And what I, the, the, that narrative I thought was going to send us into this point where we now recognize waves as, say, forces, you know, mm -hmm. that, they, that they reach this level of abstraction from thingness. And then again, all the people you turn to who were representing them as data mm -hmm. seem to say, seem to be pushing them back into the world of things because we can get data about mm -hmm. things in a certain way that we. The, 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 the trying to dataize forces becomes very ambiguous and, and difficult. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, like, where do you think it's this, the scientific, the scientific eyes treatment of waves that that sends that story back into the 19th century? In a certain way, what are the what are the forces at work on forces there? Um, the forces that work on forces. Maybe there's not one story, but part of the story would be technologies of computer simulation and modeling that run in things that people think can be calibrated to real time, right? That, and and again, people have people are very differently positioned with respect to these questions. So people who are building buoys might be extremely grumpy about, and they seem to be extremely grumpy about the virtual waves that are conjured up in computer simulation, right? So you might say, well, I've got data from this buoy and that buoy, but in order to really predict what's going to happen, I need something here. No, nope, there isn't anything here. Well, I can interpolate it from the data, and I can produce a virtual thing which I can then plug in. <coughs> and this is how a lot of weather forecasting already works, that it's based on data that's, that's only, only exists as interpolated within the cyber-spatialized world of simulation. And, and that's common practice, and some people are perfectly competent and happy about that, and other people can say, no, I really don't like that, I don't like that parameter, or that would be fine, but you can't do it using that model, mm -hmm. right? So I think that part of, um, so I guess that there's a, there's a persist, I can't believe I'm going to say this, so there's a persistent haunting by the Not real. Not recorded. Right? Okay, <laughs> there's a persistent haunting by the real, right? That, for these folks, right? That there is really something happening there. They know that it's only a partial picture. They know that better than anybody, that they've got a partial perspective on it. And yet, that attempt constantly reproduces the sense that there's a really real that's there. Right? So we end up with things that are kind of deracinated thing? That... Um, maybe. Yeah, but they would. But then waves are also the kind of thing, thing where about which people say, well, they're not things; they're processes. Right. So they're already there's already sort of a, but they're real processes, right? So they would sort of refuse the. They would say that's fine. Yes, there is sort of an abstraction, but it's a really real abstraction. It's a process. A wave is a is the is the propagation of energy through a medium. It's a certain kind of wave, like a water wave, um, and and that's what it really is. But the thinginess of it is very elusive, even with that. The, the realist would say it's a process, mm -hmm. but that's already a description. So. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to imagine you at a conference full of empirical scientists uh, making the case that waves are full of people. Right? They're <laughs> logical and they're sociological, but they're, but they're humanist formations in one way or another. And I'm, I'm wondering how that goes, because I, I, 
had the experience a couple of years ago in Cambridge at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, where I was a visiting scholar. And we were all humanists and social scientists, the, young, the younger uh, postdocs. And we had to lunch every week with really eminent scientists, like Robert Powell, who did the first um, empirical proof of relativity with a laser on top of William James Hall. And, mm -hmm. and we, we could not ever meet on this question I think Kevin's also bringing up about whether or not one's scientific measurements give you access to the real. And what, what struck me with them was that many of them, while, while professing uh, you know, an entirely empirical, if not positivist, faith in data and measurement, mm -hmm. were also very um, overtly religious and theological about this. Mm -hmm. right? The astrophysicist thought he was looking at God. The, the physicist thought he was peering into right, the deep code of the, mm -hmm. of the kind of divine nature. Right. And you know, it, you, and you can't argue with theology, right? You can't argue back mm -hmm. with theology. And so I'm, I guess I'm wondering whether something like history too, with its mystical or supernatural right. proclivities, is something that is, oddly enough, in what is also the most empirical, the most allegedly rational um, uh, discourse about waves, and whether, you know, and I'm yeah. also just curious, how do you have those conversations and do you get anywhere? Um, I would agree with what you just said about history, <laughs> his, the history one kinds of grids of, of representation are often suffused with things that are not quite the empirical positivist um, enterprises that they are advertised to be, that there is sort of the history too inside them. Um, as for how I communicate with these folks. This is a very new project, so I haven't actually tried out a lot of the stuff with them. So, as I commented, um, the word Anthropocene actually does a lot of really interesting work around that, right? So that, as I sort of quipped, I guess, it wasn't actually super surprising to these people that I was an anthropologist. Precisely because they thought that there's a human climate change story swimming in the, in the <coughs> science that they're doing, right? And so looking at you know, this, this map of the world with people, or map of, yeah, like, yeah looking, at, looking at this with people and having them tell me, you know why this is happening, don't you? The reason this is happening is because of the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because of anthropogenic processes that are fundamentally political. And you should know that, you're an anthropologist. <laughs> and so there's a kind of weird way in which the conversations are is available in that way. Now their notion of the human and my notion of the human or humans are quite different, but there is sort of a, a meeting point for some little bit of conversation, I think, right? Mm -hmm. That you can say, yes, that you're right. This I also think this is a political question. Maybe I think of it slightly differently. But this is also about a certain kind of agent, a certain kind of agency of humans. Is it is it about causality? I mean, there's human causation. Scientists get causation very readily, right? I mean, right. Is it the causation. If we humans cause climate change, if you talk about causation, I would imagine that that's that they get that very readily. If you yeah. start talking about capital, um, if a capital is seen, um, let alone the capital is seen, uh, right. I, I would imagine you lose it much more quickly. I think that's true. <laughs> I think, well, I mean, what people might want to talk about is things like agriculture, right? That they might, I mean, some of the folks that I, with whom I spoke had stories about agriculture. Well, like, you know, there's this kind of agricultural int intensification in South America or in Sub Saharan Africa, and that was a political choice. Mm -hmm. That was a bad choice. And that is leading to some of these things. So you wouldn't necessarily go through capitalism, but you could go through. You know, not political economy as you know, as we might have it, some of us. But you could go through economy. Right? You could say, well, this there is some kind of <coughs> to the history of agricultural intensification, and probably not have too much difficulty talking about that. Right? Then you could argue about, well, is that causal or is that not causal? But you wouldn't disagree that it could be. You know. I had a question. Um, well, and it's related to, to to Jason's too, in a way. Um, because you 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 bring up Donna and you bring up uh, primate visions, mm -hmm. and I I I happened to have organized a panel at one point with uh, Matt Cartmill, who's a primatologist or physical mm -hmm. anthropologist, who wrote a, a really scathing review of primate visions when it came out, mm -hmm. and and he couldn't be in the same room with her, right? And um, and I said, oh, no, no, we can, 
no, well, she's going to be there, and we'll all be good, you know. And um, and but but there is this thing about the way that um, that humanists, that anthropologists, historians, in my case, or or, or someone like Donna, um, who I you know admire as a friend, I look at that and 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 also sense the, the, the sense of violation that other people feel mm -hmm. for that kind of work, mm -hmm. right? It's like, you don't respect me, you don't respect what I do, mm -hmm. um, you feed off of me. Mm -hmm. So, 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 I, so, so I, I mean, how does that play in? I mean, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's a sense of, you know, often um, there's a sense of amusement, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, you're, you are you are a sort of an interesting object of bigger conversation among scientists, but mm -hmm. you know how does that sort of play out in, in, a, in a project like this? Well, I think that I'm going to plead anthropology. I mean, the, the hope is that anthropological fieldwork of the kind that um, situates itself within worlds of experts like scientists is meant to be also in dialogue with what they're up to, and also generates questions from the social circumstance itself, right? Um, so that, I mean, I, I haven't really gotten too far into this particular project, but with respect to earlier projects that I've done, particularly with marine biologists, um, as I think I mentioned a little bit in the brown bag earlier, I, what I found interesting were some of the, the way that these scientists and shared particular questions with me about, for example, something like, what counts as biological relatedness, right? So for a lot of evolutionary biologists, the question of what counts as a species, what counts as a relative, those are kinds of things that are not sort of settled questions for them. And they're not settled questions for anthropologists. And in fact, I think I learned how to think differently a little bit about them anthropologically from the people I was spending time with. Mm -hmm. And so anthropologists can have all kinds of relationships with the people they we spend time with, ranging from you know the completely almost completely identical, right, that one is studying a, a world in which one is oneself a very thick participant to, you know, the this, this somewhat, this, this somewhat different or slightly overlapping to the, to the quite different. And, and all of those things have different, there's no one story, I guess, right? right. Um, but I do think it is important um, in a study of this kind to be in dialogue with the scientists about whom I'm writing. I don't want to tell a story that they, that they won't recognize, right? I mean, I want people the ideal is to tell a story that that produces a new kind of um, image of what's going on, so that people can recognize something new of themselves in it. But it's all that it's all it's also familiar, right? It's also recognizable, right? And I think that there are kinds of um, bad anthropology that produce stories that are completely kind of hermetically sealed in something that has nothing to do with the concerns of the people about which the story is crafted. There are you know irresponsible ways to do this. Yes. Just mentioned that you sent the draft of this paper to the, the yes the one the one person by the, the, whom I quote by name has already seen this paper and has already vetted the quotes and has already given me some feedback as it were on on some of the claims and and so that's that's part of the process that's part of the process of the ethnography right that it's it's the field work but it's also so it's not just you know ethnography is field work and ethnography as text or film or representation but there's this kind of cycling between them, right? That the ethnography is also the work and the practice of, of the dialogue and the encounter, which can go in all kinds of directions. Sometimes it works really well, and there is a, there's a kind of mutual set of kind of understandings and accounts. Sometimes there's friction, just like in other parts of life. Sometimes things explode and fall apart in really exciting and interesting and problematic and informative ways. That can happen too. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just love this. I'm particularly um, curious uh, about studies in privacy um, and how how do you measure weights <laughs> in the middle of ice? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm because so of course, all of this is, is very much sort of alive in the IPCC stuff coming out. Yes. Um, the, last, the last few weeks. So. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how, how do you know? <laughs> well, trying to get a number of accelerometers to get 
data points for figuring out so where things are. So they're trying to move with the expos themselves? Yes, I mean, there's sort of the side view version, right, where the waves come in and break the ice up in a particular way, and there's a lot of mathematical modeling that goes into that. And I think, actually, that this is not a very well-characterized um, problem yet, which is why a lot of the folks in Australia were talking about it, because it was a really exciting scientific question to them. How do we think about directional wave scattering? You can't really see this, but these are like tiny little dots that are meant to represent ice flow fragments. Oh, so how do right? the waves actually... So this is sort of the top view, and then there would be this undulatory thing happening under that. And there's a question of what, what kind of mathematical tools would you use to model that? Can you sort of feed those back into looking at data that you get either from accelerometers or from satellites? So it's this massive triangulation kind of problem. And I don't know the details of all how it's done. That's, that's one direction that this project could go, would be to ask more about the ice people. So when you're, when you're talking with them about the Anthropocene, because I think one of the interesting things that's come out of um, when you're talking about climate change is that, you know, given well, this all of a sudden, they've kind of figured out that the Anthropocene is like a thing to talk about. So there's, you know, it's, it's all Shaka Marty. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, all of us. But, yeah. uh, but, you know, I actually, you know, was sitting down doing a bright paper, which, you know, Again, and then suddenly I thought, where did that come from? And then I had to go back and find it. And it was like yeah. a whole sort of archaeology trying to find my way back to the science that started the conversation that sort of um, through various wave patterns came to us and was sort of reverberating around. But then we come back and try to talk to them about it. How, do you, how much do you find you're having a conversation that's very, I mean, when you're, when you're talking about the Anthropocene, you're talking about the same thing as mm -hmm. them. It's become this this um, central cultural object that a lot of people can use right. sort of for very different things. Yeah, one is certainly not in the same conversation, right? And I think that's one of the problems. And that's fruitful that as well as right. That's well, that's ethnographic data, right there. <laughs> that there's a difference of usage, right? I think that the the problem that Donna Haraway points out, and a number of other folks have started to point out, of course, is that. The figure of Anthropos that is in the Anthropocene is, is a very particular way of thinking about human agency, people, things, right? Mm -hmm. That the, the idea that it's the human, as though that's one thing, as though the, the Anthropocene is the result of just sort of species being rather than a particular kind of social historical process, right? Like all those things are occluded potentially by, by using that that word, right? Um, which is why it's interesting to kind of play with these other possibilities. Mm -hmm. I think Natasha Myers has, has recently thought about calling it the algacene. What about algae? What about the agency <laughs> of algae? Right? That, I mean, it's, it, this could be sort of a parlor game where you come up with different <laughs> things, but it's actually kind of instructive to see which ones are funny and which ones are actually pointing to something that you might want to talk about. I think, mm -hmm. but I think you're you're right about the kind of attraction that this has had for humanists. It's been quite interesting in anthropology. Like, suddenly we anthropologists get to play in geological worlds. Like, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm going to talk about geology now, right? So there's a, and it's also kind of a moment of, um, I mean, it's a fetish for theory too, right? And it's a kind of a, I mean, it's the post, it's the post primate visions moment, right? So the primate visions was, sort of the precursor to what eventually would become the science force, where science studies was kind of operating the mode of critique and, and sort of, you know, and, and otherizing, I guess, the scientific practice. And then, you know, sometime in the early 2000s, you know, Bruno Latour writes why his critique ran out of steam. Donna Haraway writes um, in 2008, when species meet, and has a footnote about primate visions in that book in which she says, that she wasn't listening, and she wasn't generous enough, and that that kind of work is no longer the kind of work that she thinks needs to be happening for responsible science studies. This is also in the wake of, this is also in the context, wake whatever, of the Bush administration, right, where science becomes a very different kind of interlocutor for humanists, much more of a kind of humanist ally. And so the stories become much more about complicity rather than critique, <coughs> right? Um, and so, 
And I think that's also sort of swimming around a little bit in the new materialism as well, right? The idea that we humanists, social scientists, can start to use scientific terms too, and we're sympathetic with them now, and so we anthropologists can start to use the geological and be okay with that in a way that would just not have made any sense in 1986 or you know, 1991 or whatever. I have, um, I have made a, a commitment that this would end at five uh, mm -hmm. so that people can have a chance to uh, talk a little bit more informally. So I think we should just uh, give Stephen some uh, appreciation. <laughs>